Open that door in the Sphinx. Does the library of that knowledge lie? I think there is extraordinarily powerful evidence to suggest that this is so. If you were amongst the survivors of a high civilization, and you had been, your civilization had been destroyed in an enormous cataclysm, and you wanted somehow to keep the memory of your civilization preserved, and to pass down the knowledge to the future, and you might particularly want to do that if you believe passionately in the reincarnation of the soul, by the way. Egypt was Egypt, why didn't any Egyptians know anything about ancient Egypt? They were the Egyptians, right? They didn't know any language, any history, any hieroglyphics, nothing. They hadn't even cared to take a peek at a pyramid wall. They had to let the French invade them. To come in and tell them about their own shit? That story sounds kind of familiar. But I digress. I guess the only difference is that at the height of world slavery in the late 1700s, the Europeans didn't care to take any slaves from actual Egypt, even though the French and British were colonizing America and Egypt at the same damn time. You be, you crazy for this one. Morgan Free Vans. There was America, there was an Egypt at the same damn time. There was an America, there was an Egypt at the same damn time. There was an America, there was an Egypt at the same damn time. But for some odd reason, they only found it necessary to enslave in the Americas. Boy, you's an African, shut your mouth. Wow, imagine invading Egypt with all of its history and abundance of culture to offer the world and saying, eh, fuck it, we're good, y'all got it, y'all got it. I can't imagine a colonial European who didn't want a slave. An Egyptian slave at that? I heard they were the best ones. They built the pyramids, right? Right. Aha! And you deal with it. They can't stop us. No matter what they do, they can't stop us. Let's. They can't stop us. Let's. Let's. Nah. They can't stop us. Yeah. We ain't build no slave ship. We ain't make those anchors, we ain't plot those gray sites Up since daylight, burden by the things we try to make right It's gonna be a late night, so much turmoil Makes my blood boil, kundalini encore Earth is some broad, dirt is unsore With more core, tell a story that some spoil Watch it unfold, stories untold Copyright unsold, books with one spine Ghosts with one soul, they want control You want control, but we share one goal Fight one foe, set your front door, and it keeps knocking, but the people kept rocking, yeah. And it keeps knocking, but the people kept rocking, yeah. Stop, flex, whatever they do, they can't stop. In previous episodes, we've cataloged a plethora of American civilizations hidden from mainstream academia and by mainstream academia. And when some of these civilizations do get attention, they always have that Caucasian slant to them. Maybe even that mongoloid slant. Pun intended? Yeah, that mongoloid slant. It's pretty good. 
And most of that cocko-mongol slant reveals itself through imagery and the institutionalized dogma of the charlatan's minions who must follow the blueprint of erect homos and cave ice migrations in order to maintain his academic status, which will be stripped away at the very moment he deviates from the script. And that's exactly what his story is, a script of agreed upon lies by the Council of Deception. And that Council of Deception runs the spectrum from professors at Harvard to grade school teachers to supposedly full-blooded Native American gatekeepers and a slew of charlatans in between, whose sole purpose is to flood the public with misinformation like the government flooded Indian towns and ancient civilizations burying the truth under damned waters. That boy spitting. But even a dam can't stop the flood. And most floods are initiated with rain. But every once in a while, a flood is initiated from within the earth. And some may have looked at those floods as prophecy. The flood myth is a legend that transcends culture and time. Of course, we all know the flood narrative of the Bible, but you may be surprised to learn that the flood myth has even been told in cultures with supposedly no connection to ancient biblical history. Imagine that. Specifically in the Americas. Imagine that. Hundreds of tribes in America had their own accounts of the Great Flood, handed down for generations. Most of these accounts parallel the story of Noah in Genesis. And this evidence just doesn't exist among the histories of a few tribes in specific areas, but all over the Americas, people separated by thousands of miles all share the same story. Here are just a few tribes that have flood myths. In the plains, the Blackfoot, the Wichita, the Pawnee, and the Lakota each have legends that include the displeasement of the Great Spirit, an ark, and the rainbow as a sign, similar to Genesis 10. The same can be said about tribes from the Great Lakes region and the Ohio Valley. The Mi'kmaq, the Ojibwe have their own legend as do the Potawatomi and the Iroquois. And a number of these remembrances include the Tower of Babel. And that Tower of Babel narrative makes perfect sense considering these are tribes from the Great Lakes region. Remember the Tower of Babel video where I show you exactly where in the Americas the Tower of Babel was located. In the east, the Algonquin have their own, as do the Lenape. Moving south, the Catawba, the Yamasee, the Chickasaw, the Creek, the Chittimacha, the Choctaw, and the Natchez all have their own variations of the same story. And this doesn't include Mexico. Central or South America, who have variations of their flood narratives as well. The Hopi, the Pima, the Navajo, the Apache, and the spe specific. And you can say it's specific Northwest, but 
That crazy, boy. In the Pacific Northwest, the Spokane, the Nez Perce have their own flood myths. They're different small details, but each use a prominent mountain as their Mount Ararat. What? What? They got their own Ararat, boy. The Cheyenne, the Ute, the Arapaho, the Rapping Hoes. Some of these Ute legends state that the Ark landed on Pikes Peak, one of the tallest mountains in the Rockies. Hit a form, D. Tap the Rockies. Yeah. The core light. Woo! Tap the Rockies. Dirt! The core light. That's right. I like those pretty good. That was pretty good. That was one of your best. All of these flood accounts predate the invasion of Europeans and forced conversion of Indians to Christianity. Not that the flood account from Genesis has anything to do with Christianity. You know, unless Europeans used tribal histories in order to write Christ into their prophecies. Now, don't let that raven fly over your head. Or was it a dove? But these aren't the only flood accounts from the past histories of America. Other delusions of a smaller, less mythological scale have changed the face of the landscape. These events should be considered nothing short of a natural disaster, especially for the people who dwell along the banks of the Great River. The Mississippi, along with all of its tributaries, which are differently named the Red, the Missouri, the Illinois, the Arkansas, the Ohio. These all should be considered one and the same river who in just the last 200 years has flooded a multitude of times. And as a result of this flooding, an unknown amount of cities have been engulfed of Mexico by the river. See what I did there? That boy, that, I, I told you that boy just spitting. Hello, can I speak to Jeremy? I don't know no damn Jeremy. There's, there's no Jeremy there? I don't know no damn Jeremy. There's no Jeremy there? No, there ain't no damn Jeremy here. There's a Jeremiah though. And he and Jeremy ain't the same. The literal midpoint of the river between Memphis and St. Louis is one of the most geologically volatile locations on the continent and even on Earth. The causes of these floods from this location are born of a different parent than most other floods. Most floods are born from the sky via some form of precipitation. Whether that be flooding due to extreme amounts of rainfall are flooding from a melted ice pack. Most overflow is initiated by water. But along the New Madrid fault line, these floods are born from within the earth because earthquakes are the father of some of the worst natural disasters to ever take place along the course of the Great River. The most historically notable case in American history would have to be the New Madrid earthquake of 1812, a massive quake that induced soil liquefaction and landslides, shedding entire plots of land off the riverbanks and into the river. Other parts of the river got log jammed, causing the river to flow in reverse, cutting off the natural course of streams. 
and triggering the earth to sink like quicksand. An unaccounted for amount of people drowned within liquefied earth. The shocks were heard as far as New England and the Rocky Mountains. During this time, the Mississippi River was the extent of the western frontier and the entirety of America had yet to be colonized, only a few small outposts along the river. And at this time, no one on earth knew anything about ancient Egypt. And Memphis, Tennessee, or Memphis, Egypt, had yet to be founded or invented. This area is still considered Indian territory. And although the Americans laid claim to the land to the east of the river and the Spanish via the secret treaty with the French, their cousins laid claim to the lands west, for all intents and purposes, the vast majority of this land was occupied by Indians who would come to find themselves rebranded as Africans. For the new arrivers to the frontier, this would mean they would have to start over and build again. But for the Indians, this shaking of the earth meant a lot more. It was a sign. It was a prophecy. The mini apocalypse on the river left ancient cities buried under a sea of liquefied earth. Some of these places were claimed by Europeans and built over. As is the case with previously mentioned cities like East St. Louis, St. Louis and Memphis. A significant portion of the largest and oldest cities along the river are in reality the former empires of prehistoric biblical times. Jeremiah 46, King James Version. And the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet against the Gentiles. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet against the Gentiles not Jeremy. If you were to look at other translations, they actually translate the Euphrates to the Nile. So this only supports my point that the Nile is an improper name for tributary creek or stream and that the Mississippi is not the Nile, it's the Euphrates because the Nile really doesn't exist in the way that we think it does. You can just have the one in Africa. Against Egypt, against the army of Pharaoh Nietzsche, king of Egypt, which was by the river Euphrates and Carchemish, which Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, smote in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah. Order ye buckler and ye shield and draw near to battle. Harness the horses and get up, ye horsemen, and stand forth with your helmets, furbish the spears, and put on the brigadines. Wherefore I have seen them dismayed and turned away back, and their mighty ones are beaten down, and are fled apace, and look not back, for fear was round about, saith the Lord. Let not the swift flee away, nor the mighty man escape. They shall stumble and fall toward the north by the river Euphrates. Who is this that cometh up as a flood, whose waters are moved as the rivers? Egypt riseth up like a flood, and his waters are moved like the rivers. He saith, I will go up and cover the earth. I will destroy the city and the inhabitants thereof. Come up ye horses and rage ye chariots, let the mighty men come forth, the Ethiopians and the Libyans that handle the shield, and the Lydians that handle and bend the bow. For this is the day of the Lord God of hosts, a day of vengeance, that he may avenge him of his adversaries, and the sword shall devour, and it shall be satiate and made drunk 
with their blood, for the Lord God of hosts hath a sacrifice in the north country by the river Euphrates. The Mississippi was and is the highway of empires, and its sphere of influence dwarfed any comparison that could be made to the mislabeled Nile in Africa. The Mississippi covers a more expansive climactic, ethnic, and cultural region than the branchless river of Africa. Surprisingly, the Nile in Africa never washed away any of the remnants of the great past cities like Memphis, for example. But for some reason, Memphis completely disappears into historical Bolivian. Where do you go from here, Mike? I don't know, man. I might just fade into Bolivian. I might just fade into Bolivian. Yet, the real Memphis here in America was buried under the earth or washed away down the river and ultimately built upon by the present-day city of Memphis, the former Chickasaw capital city. This massive catastrophe ultimately facilitated the process of this supplantation. How many of these major cities along the river are actually graveyards of past civilizations? So let's take a trip down memory lane to some of these cities that were built over. We're gonna look at a few pictures here of Kansas City before it was built upon or built over. And look at, the, look at this. You can see these huge mounds that have been torn down. And it's almost like there's a hole straight through the middle. And these are some of the earliest pictures. And you notice every time they tear down a mound, Every time they move all this earth, it's like everybody wants to pose in front of the picture. You saw it at Big Mound in St. Louis and East St. Louis. Look how elevated this platform is. Here's another picture. If you live on a riverbank, then obviously you want to keep your, you, want, you really want to be able to have some elevation off the riverbank. It just doesn't make a lot of sense to unearth an area that's actually acting as high ground for flooding on the river. Obviously, there's some high ground. You can see some bluffs here, but nonetheless, you can see exactly how elevated the city is just from the river level. It says Delaware Street in Kansas City. Looking south from 3rd Street. Building at right is built on limestone bedrock. So th this is what I don't understand. So they, they built a building right up against, right up against bedrock. That doesn't make sense. One side of the street is more elevated than the other side of the street, but who builds, I mean, the build, the building is literally right on the edge of this embankment. Here's something you'll never really hear me say. I'm not a, I'm not a mud flood historian. Floods do have dirt and earth in it, so I guess you could call it a mud flood or a landslide. Right here we can see this is just earth, right? This is just a mound. When we say just a mound. This is just earth, right? We It doesn't appear as though there is any structure underneath, but once again, it doesn't really make much sense to have two buildings on the opposite side of the same street at completely different elevations, unless you're going to build into the earth or unless you are building up out of the earth. So, you know, the conjecture lies in the fact that they're building in all of these odd places that what's under these things? Are they still able to use the dwellings underneath? The whole mud flood thing has some truth into it, but the Tartarian aspect of the mud flood is the aspect that I don't really support, nor is there any evidence. And if we were to just use genetic evidence, the closest thing that we have to a Tartarian is a quote unquote Siberian, AKA Native American. 
But we also know that there are different genetic groups of Native Americans because depending on where you were on the continent depends on what kind of Australoid and or Asian features that you may have in your ancestry. Between Delaware and Main Streets on the left, we have the, the city is being built into the earth. Obviously, it doesn't make sense that they're building like this. And if you look at the house, it's up against the mound. Of course, the conjecture would come in. Well, why put a house there? Is there something there that you need to hide and you hide it in the house or within the house? There are a few elements at play. And obviously, the fuckery is at play dramatically. One would ask, what are the logistics of building like this? Did they tear the earth down to build this house in the back? And then they just decided to build this plot up here. They use these embankments in between these embankments for travel. Some of these embankments even made up canals. And you'll see a lot of these photographs are from the late 1800s. So just like the other cities that we've mentioned, we can clearly see that uh, there's some fuckery going on in Kansas City. And I'm not just talking about teenagers shooting up the parade. I was trying my best to find this article where I wouldn't have to pay for it. And I just, I, I can't do, just for the Kansas City Star, I'm not, I'm not about to do that. But um, basically, the article is entitled, A King Tut Tomb in the Arkansas Valley. On a Negro's farm in eastern Oklahoma are unearthed relics from the mound builders of past centuries. Freaking ransacked. They found a treasure trove of relics that they compared it to a King Tut tomb in the Arkansas River Valley. And so this article is from 1933, and these are the articles they don't want us to read. It's just very interesting how they decide which articles about history they want to... I can read a whole bunch of bullshit from 1922 if I want to. I can read bullshit from 1895. But if I want to read this article from 1933, I can't locate it anywhere. And I'm pretty good at finding, you know, articles if I know where to look. Editors note when Howard Carter, Howard Carter, we all know that guy. When Howard Carter, British archaeologist, opened the tomb of ancient Egyptian king Tutankhamun in the Valley of the Nile in 1922, his discoveries became immediately a matter of world interest. But Mr. Carter was supported financially by the Earl of, I don't even know, the British Museum and the Metropolitan Museum of Art of New York. Recent discoveries in an ancient burial mound in eastern Oklahoma may be of almost equal historical significance, but are yet to be recognized by any scientific organization. Not any, nor has any museum or wealthy earl come forward with financial support to classify and preserve these centuries old relics of the mound builders who inhabited the valley of the Arkansas probably before the coming of the American Indians. Probably before the coming of the American Indians. Because nobody was actually here. America is the only place where everybody in the world, they converged on America. Nobody else was here. In the following article, Mr. Mac Donald of the editor's staff, of the star staff, tells how and by whom this great mound was opened and described some of the important relics that were found in it. So here are a few artifacts that were found in Spiro Mounds. Here is some pottery. You notice how primitive the pottery is? You know, it doesn't have any of that Egyptian perfection. They just made these pots like right before Europeans came. It's, I know, it's, it's, this is shitty and shoddy craftsmanship. Can you believe that these America is Egypt? You are full of crap, boy. Boy, you are, boy, you are crappy and full of it. Look at these shitty ass pots. In terms of chronology, they're really not even that old. I mean, the stuff in Egypt is much older. Can you believe that this stuff is not even as old as that Egyptian stuff? I, I know, I know. That looks that that looks damn near brand new, but it's not though. It's five thousand years old. But this right here, it looks old, but it's kind of new. It's only five hundred years old. You know, in comparison. This stuff was just made yesterday. This shoddy pottery. Shoddery. Shittery. Look at that fucking pound, the fucking mound of dirt. What kind of crap is that? That's not a pyramid. What are you talking about? 
That's a mound of dirt, bro. All they did was just pile dirt up there, okay? Did they freaking take an 80 ton granite block and float that bitch down the river? Did they do that? No, they didn't. That's that, that's that primitive savage shit right there. Fucking savages. Not the good kind either. Oh, whoa, look at that. Man, is that a, is that a cross? Is that a cross motif? Now, first of all, I, I wonder, does that have anything to do with Jesus? Do you think that's a Jesus thing? What do you think? What do you think? Whoa, 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 whoa. Where, what is that carved on? I don't know what they carved it on, but it looks like shit. I mean, look, it looks like shit. Look at this. Look at these shitty crosses. And Did they carve that on? A, what is that? It's trash is what it is. Look at all this trash. What is this? Is that a, did they carve that on a shell? Whoa. Now I know it's bullshit. That ain't no gold, my nigga. That ain't no granite. That ain't no fucking... I don't know what the fuck... Uh, yeah, granite, I guess. Shit. If I didn't even know... If I didn't know any better, I would say there's little uh, Mesoamerican, maybe even a little bit of Aztec or Mayan influence. Nah, that's some bullshit. Because that's what the heathen said. If the heathen says it's bullshit, it's bullshit, all right? These niggas are in no way connected. N listen, actually, nobody on the continent really knew anybody. Real talk. Like, these is all different niggas doing different things, basically. Different niggas do different things, basically. And these niggas was doing their own thing. And even though it might resemble some shit that some other niggas was doing, they, they not connected, bro. And they damn sure wasn't connected to no mother. And the Egyptians, bitch. The animal with the complex fourth eye. The animal appears to be drinking from a shell cup. Damn. We're going to keep it moving, man. I'm tired of looking at all this fucking chartery. And... Bro, they ain't find nothing but trash in here, bro. I... Man, go back to Egypt, bro. You see this shit over here in Egypt, cuz? And it's older, cuz. And it's older. What you talking about? This shit over here ain't legit, nigga. Where you think they had to learn that? Listen, they listen, bro. That's all they can do over there. That's all they do over there is just make this shoddy shit, bro. That shoddy shit, bro. That that low quality, bro. That low that that that, that great value, cut nigga. You want them name brand? You want that goddamn Versace pot, bitch? You don't want that goddamn great value, bro? Yeah, these niggas. All they, oh, I bet you they got some baskets. All the niggas do have basket weavings and shit. That's how they made them arms. They was putting dirt in a basket, nigga. That's 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 technology to them niggas, bro. And all them niggas got is airheads, nigga. That's the top of y'all technology, bro. Airhead, cuz. That's all, that's all you ever hear. I found the arrowhead. I found the arrowhead. That means niggas was warring, bitch. What is you meaning, bro? Look at the cat man warrior, cuz. Now, I don't, that's a cat man warrior, bro. And that shit ain't connected to no other civilization, cuz. I see you see it. And you may think, ah, oh, that kind of remind me. It don't. Okay? It don't. It don't remind you of shit? Because it didn't influence shit. My nigga. This shit is totally independent of anything and everything that came before or after. Moving along. They ain't related no, no nobody. They came from Siberia. I don't know if you know that. That matter of fact, that nigga looks Siberian, cuz that's 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 a tar, that's a Tartarian right there, cuz. That's a that nigga Tartar, bro. You don't see it? You, you, you ain't see it, bro. That's that's clearly a Tartar, bitch. That nigga Tartar is fuck. And you see these pipes right here? You mu you must be you you must got rocks in them, bro. Look at this nigga. This nigga clearly a Tartarian. He got the Tartarian shape up and everything, cuz. These niggas came across the world, nigga. This nigga obviously got the, he got the Siberian shape up and everything, bro. Look at this nigga, bro. He, he's shaped up like a straight up Siberian Tartarian, my nigga. That's why them Native Americans be like, oh, you know, we, we, we made the mounds. They was, they was here when we got here. Then the other half would be like, oh, that was our ancestors. We don't really, you know, they was, like, nigga, shut up. 
Nigga had a tough decision one day. He was like, do I get a fucking foot long from Subway or do I become an Indian and get government rights and get government monies? Should I get this fucking foot long meatball? Or maybe I'll get this Indian identification card. It's the same price. Hmm. These are the Spiro niggers. Oh yeah, they found it on a nigger's property, by the way. That nigger ain't do nothing but put a damn, he made it, this nigger ain't do nothing but damn, make a damn ornament of his daddy and then put it down there. Sure as hell ain't no engine. Sure as hell wasn't here before the engines or after the engines or ever. You came from Africa, boy. You done forgot. You, you done forgot. Look like an African. Here's the effigy, pop. You must be smoking rocks. Here, put that in your pipe and smoke it. Yo, rockhead, you rock it. So these are just the few things that were recovered from Spiro Mounds. Remember, the majority of the things that were recovered, the majority of the stuff within those mounds has been ransacked. We have no idea where it is. This was par for the course up until like 1950, probably. Even the 80s, they were building dams to flood indigenous lands. So a lot of these artifacts that could have been recovered, flooded, bitch. And like I said, this article came from the Kansas City Star. When a person thinks about the legends of Egypt, they usually think one of two things. Either they think about the statues, the pyramids, and hieroglyphics of the commercialized Egypt through the education system, or they are reminded of biblical narratives beginning in the book of Genesis and the stories referring to Egypt throughout the Torah and Old Testament. These two are not the same. One was established by the duplicitous hand of the heathen scribe, and the other a series of histories handed down through family tradition for generations. But this goes without saying. The histories passed down from generation to generation are much older than the history of Egypt created by these people in 1812. Don't forget ancient Egypt has yet to be discovered. No one in Egypt knew anything about Statues, pyramids, hieroglyphics, or languages. Campolian didn't publish his first decipherment of hieroglyphics until after 1822. And at that point, they were far from learning anything about Egyptian history based upon their fledgling findings. This is where biblical chronology and academic chronology meet at the crossroads. The Academian's chronology has a 4.5 billion year timeline where the Big Bang and randomness initiate creation and life. Conversely, biblical chronology is fixed around 6,000 years and where creation was intended and life initiated with purpose. The polarity of these two philosophies illustrates a distinct spiritual or intellectual difference between most people on earth. Where one person may be skeptical of legend or mythology because it can be used for deception, another may be skeptical of institutionalized information because it could be used for the very same purpose. That's what makes chronology so important. and the inconsistency of Egyptian chronology cannot be ignored. The official histories and chronologies attached by the academics to ancient Egypt as we know it today do not even recognize possibly the most significant event in biblical history, the Exodus. The Exodus is not recorded anywhere on any temple papyrus hieroglyphic or stele in Egypt. As we know, this isn't the only 
chronological issue with ancient Egypt. The early dynastic Stone Age placement on the historical timeline of technological achievement is an even bigger problem for the Academian. Using their timeline, approximately the year 3100 is the birth of Egyptian dynastic history when Pharaoh Menes or Memphis aka Narmer founded the first Egyptian dynasty roughly 5100 years ago. Geographically, this site was built between Upper and Lower Egypt as the midpoint between empires. Comparatively, on the other side of the world, North America shows clear archaeological proof that during these times, 5100 years ago, contemporaneous with dynastic Egypt, it was not only thriving, but overshadowed anything in comparison that could be attributed to ancient Egypt. Following a major catastrophe that essentially destroyed, submerged, and buried civilizations from past antiquity, the charlatans were able to rebrand that history into their own history. Their timeline of history must include this guy, this guy, this guy, and probably even this guy. Not saying that this isn't their history, but it's not our history. According to their history, the only people who could have made these guys are these guys. And I don't know if you know anything about these guys, but there's billions of them. And they have yet to replicate this guy. There goes that raven. A detail that always seems to get lost when these charlatan, aka ancient academic historians observe earthworks from the Americas is the sophistication in which they were built. They always call them crude. Not only did a significant number of these works align astronomically, they were also constructed with symmetrical perfection. These things could not be accomplished by a crude and savage civilization. These had to be built with a supreme understanding of not just astronomy, but engineering and mathematics. Hidden within the form of construction exhibits how ingenious the masters of these monuments truly were. These earthen structures were not just piles of dirt. Many of these are pyramids that have been destroyed or covered by earth. They say the Indians had no architecture. They lived in the wilderness or on the plain in teepees or some grass hut. And the really advanced one lived in wooden shacks or mud dwarf towers alongside cliffs. Those were the advanced ones. Just mounds of dirt. They say these mounds are crude and primitive exhibiting none of the sophistication of ancient Rome, Greece, or Egypt, instead of stating what they really are. A working timeline of world history. With they bitch asses. Ancient monuments of the Mississippi Valley. And so all we're going to do now is just look at all these trash freaking monuments, all these dirt piles, piles of dirt. Now this is trash. A perfect fucking circle with a canal. A perfect circle with a canal a mile and a half to the Ohio River. Imagine seeing what this looked like when it was built and in current use. We have a canal that goes around the center of a mound and then flows a mile and a half to the Ohio River. In the book, Ancient Monuments of the Mississippi Valley, most of the earthworks that were documented in the book were in Ohio because the Ohio mounds were basically the most undisturbed mounds because most of the mounds in the East had already been wiped out and or completely destroyed as well as a lot of the mounds along the Mississippi. But in the Ohio Valley, many of these mounds were undisturbed. That's where they get a lot of this from. As I'd mentioned earlier, Marietta, Ohio, built over an ancient metropolis, is actually a subject of discussion in this book. Ancient Works of Marietta, Ohio, page 73 out of the Ancient Monuments of the Mississippi Valley. 
Quote, the works consist of two irregular squares, one containing 40 acres area and the other about 20 acres in connection with a graded or covered way and sundry mounds and truncated pyramids, the relative positions of which are shown in the plan. The town of Marietta is laid out over them and in the progress of improvement, the walls have been considerably reduced and otherwise much obliterated. And this was back in the day when they wrote it. They had already obliterated the walls. Oh. Another earthwork in Ohio is the Newark earthworks. So the interesting thing about these earthworks is this is where the Holy Stone was found. Both the Keystone and Decalogue Stone are inscribed in Hebrew. The Decalogue Stone also bears the image of Moses. This controversial finding infers that these ancient Indians were descendants of the lost tribes of Israel. The 10 whom were said to have been deported after Israel's conquest by the Neo-Assyrian Empire in 722 BCE. You see what they do? What they had to do was they had to superimpose that these were the ones who got deported to Assyria. But we know who got deported to Assyria. And since then, archaeologist after archaeologist after historian after anthropologist have tried to debunk the Newark Holy Stones. They can't do it. It's legit. It's so legit, they keep hiring niggas to try to debunk it, even on TV. And the top charlatans can't debunk it. Well, it seems to be legit. It's just, it's just out of place. So the box in itself it took an awful lot of work. I mean, if it, if it was really a forgery, you wouldn't go to all that much trouble to make a box for it. So uh, I think that speaks to its authenticity that someone really was, this was very important to someone. This is a lot of work, and it's polished. It's got the detailing of the grooves. It wasn't made, as far as I can tell, from modern machinery. Geologically, I don't see any problems here that would make these things obvious hoaxes. So the skeptics have rejected this. Well, that's been a factor, but the, I mean, Hebrew's an odd thing to find here. The fact that it's odd doesn't mean that it's not genuine. What it boils down to is really, the problem with these artifacts is that the academics don't like them because they don't fit the paradigm. And unfortunately for them, you can't dismiss things simply because you don't like them. Right. And so the evidence to me seems clear. There's no reason not to accept these as genuine, legitimate artifacts. Oh, it's just, it's out of place. It doesn't make sense. We can't, it's gotta be fake, okay? It's gotta be fake. Even though no one had the information or knowledge to fake such a thing. Who faked it? Who knew the language before you knew the language? If you're telling me you found something that you couldn't translate until you learned how to do it, who were the original authors? And it's always they came from Israel to over here. You see how they, they slide in the reverse fuckery? Oh yeah, they came from over there. Well, they just came from over there and nobody knew about it. Imagine what else has been found in those mounds and is still being hidden. Make sure you check out the book Ancient Monuments of the Mississippi Valley. And most of the good shit that they found, they're still hiding. They're still concealing that information. The only way that we even get the good stuff is when someone who doesn't work for the Smithsonian or some university, if they discover it, like if a real regular person discovers something, it might have a chance. But if one of these academics, one of these archaeologists or historians dig and find something, forget about it, bro. They will wag that bitch. The story is already spun, bro. It's a solid bet to wager the fact that nearly every major city along the river and its tributaries was an ancient kingdom submerged by apocalyptic disaster and supplanted by the new nation of prophecy. Here are a few cities, for example, that were ancient empires that were built over by current cities. Cincinnati, Ohio an ancient metropolis built over Marietta, Ohio, ancient metropolis built over Kansas city, another metropolis submerged and built upon Tulsa, Oklahoma, ancient metropolis, little rock, Arkansas, ancient metropolis built over Wichita, Kansas, ancient metropolis built over Paducah, Kentucky, ancient metropolis built over. Not on the river, exactly. Nashville, Tennessee, ancient metropolis built over. Knoxville, Tennessee, ancient metropolis built over. Florence, Alabama, ancient metropolis built over. 
Vicksburg, Mississippi, ancient metropolis built over. Natchez, Mississippi. Ancient metropolis built over. Davenport, Iowa, ancient metropolis built over. Sioux City, ancient metropolis built over. Minneapolis, Minnesota, ancient metropolis built over. And of course, the aforementioned city of St. Louis constructed over Mound City. East St. Louis was built over Big Mound. And Memphis built over the Chickasaw capital city. But even more secretive than constructing new cities upon the ruins of older civilizations, sometimes it was more feasible to just flood the ruins. And this would serve dual purposes. Dams built for flood control of the river, while simultaneously concealing any evidence of prior habitation under a lake of dammed water. One of these such cases took place along the Clinch River in eastern Tennessee, was what was rumored to be an Egyptian temple, along with tons of archaeological evidence, is now submerged underwater after the construction of Norris Dam in the early 1900s. The first time I heard about this was from Harry Hubbard. So let's take a detour from the river into the Tennessee Valley. This article is entitled An Ancient Egyptian Temple in Tennessee. Once again, it's kind of like all of these articles that mention these ancient sites being Egyptian or having some sort of connection. When you try to dig up the original newspaper article, you just, you draw a blank. There's, there's nothing there. They actually pretend like it didn't exist. It's just like the story with G.E. Kincaid, who the Smithsonian actually denies even knowing who G.E. Kincaid was. The ancient Egyptian temple in Tennessee that has uh, since been scrubbed from the internet, like the original title has been scrubbed, the original article has since been scrubbed from the internet. The archaeological site in question is known as Cox Mound is located about nine miles west of Clinton Anderson County, Tennessee. J. Rendell Harris and a temple in Tennessee. The story of Tennessee's Egyptian temple revolves around a British biblical scholar and curator, James Rendell Harris, who believed that Egyptians visited America before Columbus. Remember, it's always the, it's the vacation theory, right? See, Egyptians came here, right? They didn't come from here. They actually came to here. They came here before Columbus. There's all these, well, yeah, they traveled the world. They were in America before Europeans. You see the, the reverse fuckery they're trying to pull here? Because if it was classically Egyptian, right? If it was classically Egyptian and it was here first, forget about screwing over the timeline and screwing over all their history. Well, did the Egyptians come here and make more primitive things than they did in Egypt? See, something's not vibing here. Either Egyptian is a masterpiece of the ancient world that no one can figure out what they did. They couldn't even figure out the language until 1800, right? But what they did was they traveled the world to make less primitive shit in America after they had already made the shit. They visited America. He speculated that the Egyptians initially visited the Bahamas and eventually moved into the Gulf of Mexico and up the Mississippi and established a large colony in Tennessee. They did all that. By the way, there was nobody on the Mississippi. They didn't do it. They didn't meet, greet, or do anything. The only way that these guys would even try to support any ancient history in America is if they came from the other side of the world. Harris saw a photo in a newspaper article about an excavated site in Tennessee that he believed was an Egyptian temple due to the standing stones forming the perimeter of a square building. This story has been embellished and made mysterious with some internet sources claiming a cover-up of ancient Egyptians in America and that the excavation was halted when the temple was found. Once again, if ancient Egyptians came to America from Egypt, at least we know what Egypt was supposed to look like 5,000 years ago. Oh, so beautiful. I mean, so, 
so symmetrically perfect, right? They came to America to just make some old stupid bullshit, basically. In 1933, the TVA, Tennessee Valley Authority, organized a conference with university representatives and government agencies to plan a survey of Native American sites that would be submerged after the completion of Norris Dam. The project was conducted by Civil Works Administration and Federal Emergency Relief Administration funds and was supervised by William S. Webb, the chairman of the University of Kentucky's Department of Anthropology and Archaeology. Hey guys, we're about to we're about to drown some mounds, bro. Hey, call the guy, call the professor. Cuz we're about to drown some mounds, bitch. The excavation work was carried out by students under the guidance of supervisors. The project identified 23 sites with 29 mounds, including 12 burial mounds and 17 mounds with prehistoric structures. Structures. Prehistoric structures. Hell yeah, we better flood that bitch. We can't let nobody find a structure, nigga. A mother structure, nigga. These niggas didn't make structures, bro. They found out these niggas was making structures, nigga. Listen, man, it's, it's just dirt, all right? It's just dirt and teepees, my nigga. It's dirt and teepees, right? They put a teepee on top of the dirt. That's how it is. Well, that's what we're going to call them the Dirt and Teepee Society, bro, because that's, that's really all it is. The report on the project was published by the Smithsonian as Ethnology Bulletin 118 and contained many photos of the excavation, artifacts, and skeletal remains. Well, we definitely taking a look at that shit. Cox Mound in Tennessee was excavated in 1934 and found to have been constructed from a series of structures built on top of each other forming an eight foot high mound. Really? A series of structures built on top of one another forming an eight foot high mound. That's only, it was only eight feet. It was only, it was only an eight foot mound. I mean, there was nothing. Actually, it didn't even go into the ground. It was from eight. That's it. Eight feet. That's all mounds. You know, they, they little, bro. They, this is hella small, bro. The mound contained 49 burials and a nearly square building made from upright red cedar post and a sod roof. The building collapsed and was rebuilt twice, but some of the original cedar posts have remained and were incorporated into later structures. The building contained limestone and sandstone blocks, as well as a pile of 200 irregular rocks. Irregular rocks. 200 of them, too. Although other mounds contain standing stones, it is interesting that the features that caught Harris's attention in the photograph were not actually standing stones, but instead were remnants of unearthed cedar posts. A thorough examination of the artifacts discovered during the excavation revealed that they were fairly typical of Native American objects typically found in Mississippi settlements that were active in that area during the period from the 1200s to the modern area. Oh, the 1200s. That's it. 1200s, right? None of this shit is ancient. It's just, you know, barely, it's just a little old. Just a little old. The people are gone, though. We don't even know who they are. They they have disappeared. As of now, all of the sites excavated in the TVA project have been submerged for almost 80 years. The more conspiratorial among us believe that the project was flooded in order to cover up the ancient Egyptian artifacts that were found there in order to preserve our current understanding of history. Yeah! There you go. The more conspiratorial among us. Man, you know what they should do? Because I hear that they need water in Egypt. They should just flood the pyramids. Just flood them. Dig a hole. Flood them. Because it doesn't fucking matter. Apparently. Half the reason why everybody thinks it's conspiratorial is because they don't really even understand history. They want to find actual Egyptian artifacts. It's kind of like when I see these videos and there are people just using some copy and pasted Egyptian image and then making it look like it was found in America. Now you have these fucking agents of misinformation who go around talking about America as Egypt, but then they give you some bullshit. They want to say, oh yeah, there's a Sphinx in the Grand Canyon, but that picture's from Pakistan, my G. That's not the Grand Canyon. That's in Asia. Yes, there is a Sphinx in the Grand Canyon, but that ain't it. That is a picture from Pakistan. So now you got to combat the misinformation because people think, oh, it's just going to be a fucking, it's going to be a King Tut and motherfucking the Grand Canyon. We are the founders of the ancient civilization. America is the founder of all of the ancient civilizations that went to other parts of the world. They're not before, they are after America. So nothing's going to look like fucking King Tut, bro. 
the stuff that you're gonna find here is gonna be the most primitive because it was first the reason they call it crude is because it was first this occurred when man was first learning how to manipulate the elements into things that he could consider art and structure and or technology what you see across the world is a result of later progress and advancement so when you look at this stuff you say oh it's primitive it's because it was first i am in the book bureau of american ethnology bulletin 118 they actually do go over all of these sites it's a pretty thorough book and it will be in the packet by the way if you donated for the references you will get the packet with this book in there and a lot of other books actually with some good information so this is the picture that the guy from the british museum at rendell harris j rendell harris i believe his name is this is the picture that the guy said was egyptian that was a classic egyptian picture it had some sort of connection to egypt so these pictures are from the bureau of american ethnology bulletin 118 these are the pictures that made him speculate about an Egyptian temple in East Tennessee. You can see here, there's supposedly a central altar here. And obviously these are all different sites. This is number 26, site number five. And another site, site number two, mound number two, site number nine. We're talking about an ancient society here, more ancient than what they're calling ancient on the other side of the world. That should be clear. And of course we have some skeletal remains. Another thing that I mentioned in the Anubis video is that there are a couple of different postures that signify how the Egyptians buried their dead. And one of them here, you can see how they are in a kneeling pose and their hands almost in a praying pose. If you see the sarcophagus of King Tut or any other Pharaoh that's been exhumed, you'll notice that they're not flexed. They're actually extended. And again, 70% of French and Spanish people have King Tut DNA. The dog was buried with the deceased because the dog was the guide to the underworld, AKA Anubis, AKA Jolo. Here's a quote from the book, page 112, quote, perhaps the most important find at this site was the use of pit burials in the floors of houses. Here, in three out of four adult burials, the body was definitely placed in a pit in a sitting posture, surrounded with an unusually large number of artifacts and often accompanied by the burial of a dog. And often accompanied by the burial of a dog. The mythology of Anubis. The dog was the guide to the underworld. Continuing further, the Creeks seem to have been the only one of the tribes reported to have deposited a wide variety of objects in the grave and also sometimes included dog burials. End quote. So we can see not only did they bury themselves with dogs, they buried themselves with what we would call their possessions. Something that they said that the pharaohs did or the Egyptians did. So not only did they bury themselves with their dog, they also bury themselves with their possessions. Some would say that would be characteristically and customarily Egyptian, but we know that they don't have anything to do with one another. There's no coincidence or connection. So we see a few different things. We see rock mounds, we see altars, or what we perceive as altars. We actually see steps and stairs. Honestly, these are really good photographs and imagine how much more we would have found by now. But of course, the the entire thing is submerged. Yeah, I definitely recommend you check this one out. This book has great images and diagrams of the mounds that are now flooded in Tennessee. By the Norris Dam. This goes beyond the superficiality of the newspaper article, right? You actually have to get into understanding culture. The main issue when people look at this information is that they are looking at the connection between America and Egypt in an inverse fashion.
America is the predecessor to Egypt. Smithsonian Institution Bureau of American Ethnology, the excavation of the Tennessee River Valley. This isn't the only site the Tennessee Valley Authority flooded in the early 1900s. Several sites along the Little Tennessee were also inundated after the construction of dams. Not far from Knoxville, Tennessee, an archaic site said to be over 9,000 years old was sunken following the construction of Teleco Dam, literally one of the oldest sites in the world destroyed. some more things found in the mounds of Tennessee that have absolutely nothing to do with ancient Egypt. This little design here, many archaeologists find that it's the predecessor to the yin and the yang, or the yin yang, or the yin yang twins, basically. So we can tell that the yin yang twins originated from near Nashville. Yin yang and his thing. Yin yang and his whistle while you twerk, nigga. There's no connection to Egypt, it's just a it's just a design, alright? It's just a little squirrely thing, it's cute, alright? There's no significance, nigger. God, you see this? This image, composed of a dark colored clay and crushed river shells from the stone grave of a child on the summit of a burial and sacrificial mound on the banks of the Cumberland River in Nashville, Tennessee. One fourth the natural size. You see this right here? You see this little ornament here? You see how their hands are crossed there? That has, there's no way that's connected to Egypt. All that shit in Egypt is way smoother than that, my bro. And it's older, like this is only from like 1200. That shit from Egypt is like 12 million years old, okay? You see how it still look good, right? You see how that shit in Egypt still look good? You see this shit right here, that's trash, bro. I don't know why she crossing her arms like that, but I know that shit ain't got nothing to do with Egypt, bro. Another clay vase found in Tennessee with a little cross motif on it. That's cute. That don't mean nothing. That don't mean nothing at all. I'm surprised. They don't even know. They, they, don't, they didn't know nothing about Jesus, bro. What you mean? Oh, shit. This look like a Caucasian bitch. You can tell by the lips. Well, shit then. Maybe there was some white bitches in Tennessee. Well, we know there's some white bitches in Tennessee. Profile view of a small hollow image from an aboriginal mound in the Valley of the Cumberland. Oh, there's a little cross on there and I don't know, maybe the hands are broke off. Maybe a little Venus de Milo or uh, maybe they're maybe they're supposed to be across the chest. Not like an Egyptian, but you know, like a like maybe like a Tartarian cross, you know, maybe a Siberian cross, maybe a Caucasian, a Caucasian Mongo cross, you know? A Finnish Chinese mountain nigga. And here are some earthworks, a huge pyramid in the middle, a truncated pyramid without a point. And I would also like to make a point that the big ass, the, those motherfucking pyramids over there in Egypt, they truncated too, bro. You think that it goes straight to a point at the top, right? But nah, it, it, it's cut off at the top. And remember in the video, the, the pyramids of shit video, where they had found the, what do they call it? The Pyramidian or some shit. They, they actually found the capstone to one of the pyramids. They, they just never put it on. That's what they did. Matter of fact, the pyramids are a complete work. Did they, just, did they just abandon the pyramids? You know, similarly to how they say that the pyramids were built as tombs for the pharaohs. But ain't nobody buried in none of those motherfucking pyramids. Meanwhile, we got all these burial pyramids here in America. I wonder how anybody even got the idea that someone was buried in a pyramid. Where did that idea come from? They just, I guess it was just a thin air. Just, just oh yeah, 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 yeah. There, that's where the pharaohs were buried, in the, in the pyramid. And when they dug, there was not one fucking pharaoh in a fucking pyramid. But there are plenty of pyramids in America. You know, the truncated ones, you know, the ones without the sharp top, just like the one in Egypt. 
But the difference are people are actually buried in those pyramids here. Anyway, here's another statue, not Egyptian. It's called a, it's called a, uh, the man giving fellatio statue, uh, head. It is a statue of a man's head, apparently in the act of head. Maybe just a little, uh, porn stone there. I don't know. Gay porn stone. Now, these were found in the Cumberland Valley, Tennessee, but I know what they look like. They look like those statues that were found at the mounds in Georgia, the Etowah Mounds. But there's no connection. There's no connection here. We can connect these guys with the Toltecs. We can't connect them with Etowah. We can't connect that with Mexico, right? And we definitely can't connect none of that shit with Egypt. So these are cute. We have a stone image in Henry County, Tennessee, one fourth the natural size profile image. Look at this. Look at this image. So we found another stone image in Henry County, Tennessee. And here are more idols found in Tennessee. You noticing a theme here? There are a lot of little statuettes and idols that have been found. And this one here is basically a comparison between one found in Tennessee, two found in Tennessee, and one found in the Pyramid of Cholula in Mexico. You know, these aren't connected. Places that have been flooded. Bellows Lake, Little Egypt, North Carolina flooded. Lake Eufaula flooded lake martin alabama flooded walter f george lake dam reservoir clay county georgia black town former indigenous town flooded lake marion south carolina former indigenous and freedman city flooded Of course, Lake Lanier, Georgia, Oscarville, flooded, Cherokee removal, flooded, Lake Hartwell, South Carolina, flooded. Lake Norman, North Carolina, indigenous Catawba Indian settlement, flooded. Fontana Dam, North Carolina, indigenous settlement, flooded. There are plenty of examples of Negro slash indigenous towns that have been flooded and their histories concealed under damned waters. And underneath those waters, there are even more examples connecting America to Egypt.